Welcome to episode 62 of the Breaking Bio podcast. I'm Morgan Jackson, a PhD student at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. I'm Heidi Smith-Parker. I'm a postdoc at the University of Texas at Austin. Hi, I'm Tom Housley. I'm a PhD student at the University of Stirling in Scotland. And today we're joined by Dr. Stuart Wigby, who's a NERC Research Fellow at the University of Oxford. Hi, Stuart. Thanks for joining us this week. you want to tell everybody at home a little bit about yourself and your work? Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm a, an evolutionary biologist, and my research focuses on the themes of sex and life history, and I mostly use fruit flies. Um, and I, I'm a NERC research fellow, but only for another few days, actually, and then I'm becoming a BBSRC research fellow. Um, so, yeah, that's me. <laughs> uh, so you you got this big grant from BBSRC to study the links between sex and death. Um, what, what are you going to be doing? <laughs> um, so it's, it's even worse than that. It's, it's focusing on <laughs> sex and death and, um, and seminal fluid. It's all about how um, it's all about the male biological clock, really, and trying to understand how aging affects um, male reproduction, the consequences for male fitness and for the fitness of females that mate with um, old males. Um, so I, I think this is a bit of an understudied area, actually, because um, it's quite difficult. It's much more difficult to measure male reproductive success than female reproductive success. It's always cryptic and occurs. By females, and um, and also uh, effects on on uh, in some species, like in, in humans, the effects of aging on male reproduction are pretty subtle compared to the effects on females. You know, there's no male menopause or anything like that. There's some kind of gradual decline that might be quite variable between individuals. So yeah, that's what I'm planning on doing over, over the coming through few years. Uh, can I ask, what is BBSRC, for those oh, of us the, not Tom? <laughs> it's the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council. Okay. And then back to fly sex. Um, how, does, how does the sperm actually, does like morphology change, or you get differences in sort of motility? What changes over age with flies? Like what's known? Um, not, not a huge amount is known, actually. Um, so that there is there is some evidence out there, you know, unsurprisingly as people have been studying flies so intensively for so long, some evidence that ageing affects, um, affects male reproductive success. But um, when it comes to the, the uh, ejacula specifically, there's not a great deal known. Some kind of evidence for a dip in fertility, but um, there's, there's very few studies that actually are very specific about it. You know, sometimes they just bunged a load of flies together and, you know, said, oh, they have less offspring as they get older. Um, so there's, there's little bits of almost anecdotal evidence or sort of bits that were, were kind of um, a sideline in a project, but um, relatively few studies that have really focused on what's going on um, with, the, uh, with the ejaculate itself. Hmm. Um, and in particular, like, yeah, I don't think there's, I can't think of any studies where, you know, anybody's counted sperm numbers or measured ejaculate size or looked um, in detail at female post-mating responses or anything like that. So what exactly is in the, the male ejaculate in Drosophila that you're so interested in? Um, so my research in the last few years and, and currently is... Um, has focused, well, one of my research streams has focused on the seminal fluid proteins, um, in particular on some well-characterized ones that have a big effect on female physiology and behavior after mating. So um, I guess the sort of the key one that I've been working on is called the sex peptide, and this um, inhibits female receptivity and stimulates egg laying after mating. Um, but, um, yeah, we've been focusing just on that protein, but there's actually about 150 different proteins that are transferred to females in the ejaculate. So another of the sort of key things that I want to start doing is using new techniques like proteomics to 
to um, try and look at the whole ejaculate composition rather than just sort of cherry picking a particular protein or, or just looking at the sperm or something like that independently. You can actually look at the whole proteomic um, package that gets transferred. That's the plan anyway. That sounds uh, like a lot of work if you're talking about tracing down the, the functions of all 150 peptides. Um, how much? How many of them are known, you know, individually? Like, how much of this is going to be totally new and coming out with? Never mind the synthesis between them all. Um, yeah. So I, I don't think in five years I can work out the functions of all of those 150. Um, thankfully, there's um, yeah, there's a lot more work to be done. Um, so hmm, yeah, how many are actually well characterized? There's, there's I'd say that well characterized, there's probably like a handful, you know, four or five um, that have had some characterization, maybe up into double figures. Um, but beyond that, it's mostly um, proteins that are, whose function would be inferred from sort of gene ontology type uh, information. Um, so, so there's a whole bunch of stuff that you don't really know what's going on. And the sort of paradox in it all is that it seems like sex peptide and a handful of other proteins kind of do everything that you could imagine. So um, there's always this kind of, what on earth are all these other ones doing? So I'm kind of hoping that by actually quantifying um, how the rest of the, um, the protein content of the ejaculate changes with age or you know, social environment or whatever, that will give us some clues as to whether particular classes of proteins are strategically allocated or, um, or, or respond to aging in different ways. Are the, the specific ones that you're looking at um, that you know now some bit of sequence to, are these things that are highly conserved across other Drosophila species? Um, they're a bit of a mixed bag, the um, ejaculate proteins. So some of them are the, you know, ridiculously fast evolving um, proteins. So one of them called ovulin, which stimulates ovulation, for a while was known as the fastest evolving protein in the world ever. I think that's been usurped now. Um, but uh, yeah, others seem to be pretty well conserved. And, and the sex peptide itself is a kind of curious one because the receptor to it in females seems to be remarkably well conserved. Um, but the protein itself, um, bits of it are conserved and other bits aren't. And it's also extremely small, so initially people found it difficult to find it in different species. But I think as genomic techniques have improved, then actually it's, um, it's, it's um, proving to be a bit more conserved. And there's weird, other weird things about it, like um, really distantly, um, it's biologically active in really distantly related species, distantly related as in like Lepidopteran species. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of curious story. Sort of sounds like the sodeferin in salamanders, which evolves also very quickly. But sodeferin is, uh, evolves so rapidly that you get specific populations that really become isolated and respond to different ones. Do you have I mean, you probably have access to wild-type isolates and things you can work with. Do you expect that you'll have such, you know, maybe different sequences within specific populations? Hmm. Um, yeah, there has been some work on this, and um, I'm struggling to remember exactly what the literature has shown um, in terms of the variation and what it actually means for that particular protein. Um, I didn't know if there's a receptor that's so specific for something, but I guess, hmm. Yeah, it, it seems to have a, well, that story's getting complicated as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, that there is a receptor, the sex peptide receptor, but then it seems like there's some other um, sort of ancestral receptors which are kind of similar, and also the, the pathway by which it actually... Um, there, there's some receptors in the um, female reproductive tract, but then it seems like there's also alternative pathways to the female brain other than mm. these receptors. So um, what would 
what started off as a really beautiful, um, beautiful, simple story with a kind of like straightforward in-out answer um, has, has turned out to be quite a typical bit of biology. And it's actually painfully complicated, but that's good, right? Yeah, it makes it interesting. <laughs> um, so I want to know, how did you get your students to start dancing their PhDs? <laughs> if I can be the one that takes, takes that question. <laughs> um, it's I'd amazing. Be, yeah. like, I will say, when I saw this, I was like, oh, yeah, that's awesome. There's no way I would make a video of myself dancing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it didn't take too much persuading for Cedric to, to do this. He's um, a bit of a dynamo. Um, yeah, so I've, I've actually had, like, I've, t I've had quite a back seat in all this sort of stuff. Um, Cedric Tan, who's um, who won the Dance Your PhD thing last year, he's just um, he's just crazy for this um, science communication via the medium of dance videos um, and all sorts of <laughs> other stuff. Um, he uh, yeah, he's, he's quite a um, quite a driven guy. So I I think he. He first did a video and it didn't it didn't win anything. So it's like right next year, I'm definitely going to win. And then he won the biology category of dance at PhD, and he was well that's okay, but I didn't win the overall thing, so I've got to win the overall thing next time. <laughs> and um, his his projects just get bigger and more ambitious each time. And he's kind of um, it's just through sheer force of will, he's now kind of invented his own job and persuaded somebody to give him funding to do it. It's quite amazing. Um, like literally, he's like written his own job description. It's brilliant. Um, so are you still providing all the music for him in his new job, or is that something that's uh, left by the wayside? No, we're still we're still collaborating on, on music then. So his, his next big, big project, which I better not say too much about, um, but it is going to be a big exciting project about evolution and sex. Um, I'm going to hopefully provide at least some of the music for. Um, so yeah, that's all still going on. That's very fun. And we've got some new kind of social media superstars in the lab now. We've got um, there's a student called um, Sally LePage has been doing um, a sort of rotation project in my lab. And she, um, she won uh, there's a British newspaper called The Guardian. She won um, the short video contest for that, the video about evolution. And she's going to possibly be in some BBC children's wildlife show and everything. It's, it's all very exciting. I don't know why, why I end up with students who are such social media superstars, but it's brilliant. It's great. <laughs> oh, absolutely nothing to do with me. I don't know. <laughs> very lucky. Uh, so if we can get back to your research, but we can stick with humans. So you had uh, your group produced a paper a little while ago on how selflessness is sexy. Mm. Um, <laughs> can you tell us a bit about that and the uh, media response to it? Um, okay, well, I, I should confess with this particular paper that it's something that I um, came in sort of, um, well, probably... I was going to say halfway through, but actually probably even more towards the end than that, so I shouldn't take too much credit for the, the whole um, idea. Um, but it was, it was really neat, actually. Um, so it was a, a project which involved um, getting people to rate the attractiveness of, of people's faces on cards. Um, and um, other than the, the picture of somebody's face, there was some information about what kind of person they were. So I had some kind of neutral information, like, you know, this person likes going to the cinema or enjoys the films of Leonardo DiCaprio or whatever. Or it had some bit of information about how um, altruistic they were. So, you know, they volunteer at a charity or they, you know, look after disadvantaged children or something. Um, and it all came out exactly how you'd expect. So, um, so people found more altruistic people more attractive, um, and it was more important for women than it was for men. And when it came to long-term relationships, 
it was more important than for short-term relationships. And for men, for short-term relationships, it didn't make any difference. They don't care. In fact, it had a slight negative effect. So <laughs> men seemed to prefer women that were not altruistic. It seemed to be a turn <laughs> Girl, I need you making my dinner. Quit feeding those stray cats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. I'm not sure what that was about. Uh, so, I was um, amused to see in the uh, in the paper then the example for the I think the altruistic was you know feeding disadvantaged children and the neutral was uh, really likes watching Torchwood and I was just thinking, <laughs> is that neutral? I can definitely see why people would not find that uh, a sexy thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'm assuming they weren't all based around uh, how much you enjoy Doctor Who spin-offs. Um, yeah, so I, I wasn't involved in that, <laughs> that end of things, um, but I'm reliably informed that it's it's kind of tricky to actually come up with genuinely neutral things because I'm um, say yeah because there's there's variation in people's per personal preferences so. Um, uh, yeah, there's, there's maybe no, no such thing as a truly neutral statement. Um, yeah. I don't know, that's, that's the world of psychology, which is not one that I'm too familiar with. Um, I found that the media response was, it wasn't that wild, actually. I thought this would go crazy, but yeah, there, was, there was plenty of um, stories about it, but it wasn't like... Uh, uh, there was no sort of and finally in the daily sport or whatever. Daily, the Daily Star or Sunday Sports, does that still exist? I don't know. Um, and I wasn't called a boffin, which was very disappointing. That's still <laughs> my ambition, I'm called a, a boffin by a newspaper. I'm trying hard. <laughs> well, with your, with your work on aging and, and uh, sexual competition and all that. I'm sure that you have a lot of interactions with the media as people try and extrapolate your work with Drosophila to what it might mean for the George Clooney's of the world. Um, ha have you had much other media feedback or cases where the media just maybe reaches a little bit too far than what the science is actually talking about? Um, probably the worst one actually was um, a fairly <laughs> a fairly kind of innocuous paper we had which just looked at transcriptomic responses to um, receiving a, a seminal fluid, receive, receiving sex peptide. So transcriptomic changes in females after receiving a sex peptide. And um, Daily Mail headlines was all about how sex alters genes in women. <laughs> so they, they didn't even vaguely pretend it was on fruit flies. Um, and there was no kind of hint that it was anything to do with sort of gene expression. It was like having sex will change your genes. Um, <laughs> so I was quite. It, it was just. Uh, yeah, it wasn't even a. It wasn't a particularly exciting paper. Well, I mean, you know, it was a nice bit of science, but I didn't. I didn't think it would be that. I, I never crossed my mind that actually make it into the media and then you get um, the Daily Mail, which is like it's ridiculously widely read now, isn't it? Saying something stupid about it. Um, when things like when things like that come up, I'm never sure if someone comes across your paper, and directly they're like, "Oh, female transcript changes from sex with male," or if it's like this telephone game effect where it becomes, you know, sort of a little bit of change over time that ends up with this like grossly, sort of maladjusted title. Yeah, I, I wondered that too, actually. Um, but, but yeah, I've no idea. I mean, a lot of the papers seem to get that stuff direct from the university press offices, um, the, the press release. And so that's that usually seems to work out okay because you have some control over that press release. But then, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe then other newspapers see that first newspaper article and then just sort of modify it a bit and you have a sort of Chinese whisper effect. I don't know. But um, I don't know. I try and take the attitude that. I don't know if one one person in a thousand who gets exposed to this stuff actually had, like thinks about what it means in terms of science and gets interested in it. Um, then, well, actually one in a thousand would be quite ambitious, wouldn't it? Maybe one in ten thousand or a hundred thousand. <laughs> um, then that's still a result, I would say. 
I, so I, I wanted to just ask you quickly about, um, you had a really neat study recently that was very sort of broadly appealing where looking at how um, competition might switch to cooperation um, again in Drosophila. So can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. Um, so this was a paper we had um, which um, showed that when you have groups of competing males in fruit flies, when they're all brothers, then um, they seem to be less harmful to, to females. So generally, being put with a group of males means that females will have reduced lifespan and fitness compared to if they just have sort of intermittent exposure. Um, but, but yeah, when the males are brothers, they court less and they fight with each other less and generally less harmful to the females. Um, so yeah, it's made a few splashes in the headlines. I'm just going to correct you slightly there um, in the sense that I'm not sure I'd regard it as cooperation so much as just slightly reduced conflict. <laughs> it's not like all of a sudden they're, you know, picking up little bits of yeast and taking them to the female and being all nice. They're still being pretty mean, just marginally less mean. Um, if they were but that's still cooperation in my book. So yeah, this 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 uh, I think it made the New York Times had uh, quite a nice little article about it. Um, I was quite surprised at how good the science reporting was about this one. Actually, it was no kind of wild claims about what it would. Um, I don't know. Well, you, you could use your imagination to. <laughs> try and work out what kind of media headlines you could try and make from that sort of thing. So are you interested in doing any more kind of work on kin selection theory or...? Um, well, yes. <laughs> I'm scientifically <laughs> interested in it. The experiments were an absolute nightmare um, because um, you know, putting a bunch of flies together and, and measuring lifespan and egg production is one thing, but then when you've got to make families and um, that's just oh, it's, it's it's a huge amount of work. It's it, it, it like much more than doubles the amount of um, setting up work. So um, yeah, we are we are following this up. We're doing some work. Um, so the lead author on that study, Paul Carazzo, is um, thinking about um, some future experiments to answer some of the questions that were kind of posed in that experiment. So we found this, one of the, the odd things we found was that when you have a group that consists of two brothers and an unrelated male, the unre unrelated male um, seems to father loads more of the offspring. So you'd expect that, like the null hypothesis would be that they'd father a third each, but actually the unrelated male fathered half of the offspring and the, the two brothers were only sharing the other half. Um, so yeah, one of the things we're doing is trying to work out why that is. Um, and um, there's there's the questions as to how flies tell who each other is. So whether they actually can say, this fly is genetically related to me, or whether they need to grow up in the same vial or something. You know, there's a sort of familiarity effect or something like that. So yeah, there's, there's tons of questions that we need to sort out. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> we're all fighting who's going to go next. Um, do you go to the fly meetings? I've never been to a fly meeting, actually, no. Because um, you're, I mean, a lot of Drosophila work is a bit dry, maybe, a little bit boring, <laughs> but like you're doing really cool stuff. I wondered if you were like, yeah, I own this fly meeting. I'm the only one doing something exciting. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure how to respond to this. <laughs> um, so now you're like maybe yes. thinking you should go. Um, so from what I've heard about the fly meetings, they're fun in this in the sense that a huge conference, and there's loads of really exciting stuff going on there. But um, I guess, like, you know, there's, there's, you know, probably tens of thousands of people working on fruit flies at any one time, um, and the vast majority of those are going to be doing molecular and cell biology and not have that much interest in behavior and evolution. 
maybe increasingly behavior, um, but it's it's not traditionally a sort of a forum for evolutionary biologists, I think, as I understand it. Um, I'd be happy to have somebody from a fly meeting come and beat me up for <laughs> getting that horribly <laughs> wrong. Um, so, yeah, I, I've not been to one of them, but they sound exciting just by scale, if nothing else, because they're absolutely massive. I can't remember how big, but like, much bigger than any conference I've ever been to. Um, I thought East, like, the evolution, the European evolution meetings were big, but they're, they're dwarfed in comparison to the fly meetings, I think. Yeah. I think. I mean, I've I've never been to a fly meeting. I did my PhD on C. elegans, though, and I went to the C. elegans meeting, which is much smaller. Right. They're often like exhausting. You need a little bit of you know, some paper on like pinnipeds or something weird being thrown in. <laughs> <laughs> some excitement. Um. So, yeah. How big was a C. elegans meeting then? Uh, maybe six thousand. Maybe that's not. That's pretty yeah, good. That's, that's a massive meeting in my world. <laughs> yeah, yeah but totally. I mean, the Society for Neuroscience meetings are like thirty, thirty-five thousand people. Really? Okay. No, I've I've never been to a conference that size. Yeah. I, I don't know how to cope. You yeah. must just completely take over a, a a town or a city. Yeah. Also, if you see someone's talk, you have to find them right away because you'll never see them again. Mm, right. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's like bigger than the town I grew up. I, I guess, yeah. I guess, um, yeah. I grew up in a town of five five thousand people, so it's ridiculous. Um, yeah, I, I guess my favourite meetings tend to be ones which are sort of fifty or a hundred people, something like that, where you pretty pretty much get to know everyone at the meeting at some point. Um, they've been the most valuable ones to me in the past. Um, so I'm not saying that very big meetings aren't valuable, but just kind of. If I've got if I get a choice, I'll go for the little ones. I think. Yeah. <laughs> the specifically about fly seminal fluid proteins or something like that. Yeah. I totally hear that. Well, unfortunately, we're pretty much out of time. Uh, where can people keep up with your lab's work on on all this evolutionary biology, as well as keep checking out the latest dance routines and, and music <laughs> shows that that you're putting on? Um, I've got a fancy new website actually called wigbylab.com um, and I'm on Twitter um, yeah that's I haven't made a Facebook page yet um, so yeah wigbylab.com or the Oxford University website I have an online presence <laughs> I try to do anyway I've been told that would be helpful <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think it is but then when I say this to other people, I often just kind of get laughed at. Um, so I don't know. Maybe there's a bit of a split at the moment in, in academia. About I definitely, I think for a lab, I think having a website and up-to-date information is really important when you're trying to, you know, recruit and put your work out there. Well, I seem to keep attracting social media superstars into my lab, so, um, so maybe it's working. Maybe it's <laughs> causing an effect, I don't know. Must be doing something right there. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> awesome. Well, for everybody listening at home, uh, you can find us online as well by looking for the Breaking Bio blog, where you can find all of our old episodes at breakingbio.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Breaking Bio. And, of course, you can find us on Facebook as well by searching for the Breaking Bio podcast. That's it for this week. I hope you'll join us next week with a new guest. Bye.